Okay, um, so I'm uh, quite nicely following on from Thor's talk um, about programming, uh, programming as notation. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of tools for analysis and for evaluating the user interface of not only programming languages but music notations uh, and also user interfaces. Um, specifically, uh, can I have a brief retrospective of what we think about notation and what we use it for, the traditional uses in music, the traditional uses in computing. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about uh, some ideas about what makes a notation live, effectively. And I don't mean in terms of uh, a concert, but I mean in terms of being able to interact with it, being able to have an immersive experience with actually working with it, and how it supports creativity rather than just productivity. Uh, and to this end, I'm going to introduce a concept from um, programming uh, called liveness, which was introduced in 1990 by Steve Tanamoto, which is the accessibility of uh, domain feedback. So in music, we're talking about effectively sound. Um, and I'm also going to talk about the cognitive dimensions of notation, again, something that came out of uh, the psychology of programming language design, um, which, is, uh, which actually has been adapted to serve for music, uh, music interfaces, uh, and I've recently tried to extend this to look at how we design user experiences for music systems. So, uh, here's uh, standard music notation. It's all very neat. Uh, there's a very powerful notation. Um, it's incredibly formal. Okay, it in, kind of imbues a correctness. Uh, and as such, it's not really something you tend to work in on the computer during the creative <coughs> okay? There's, there's no interactivity, there's too much work you have to do to get it looking right to be able to experiment with ideas. It's not good for exploratory creativity. It doesn't tolerate uh, mistakes, uh, ambiguity, or things like that. And for that reason, most people, most musicians, at least traditionally, don't use notation or even sequences uh, in their creative process. They use it as the latter productive stage, uh, basically a transcription exercise. Uh, here's another notation, uh, if we broaden the definition a little. Yeah. This is not a, a human readable one. Uh, this is a machine readable notation. That's just MIDI, effectively. Again, we're talking about uh, correctness and this idea of formalism. And even when you have more experimental ideas, they tend to be not part of thinking about the process, but perhaps specifying performance or uh, communicating with other people. OK, but let's think about another type of notation. Let's think about sketches. OK, so this is effectively an informal type of notation. And this does support the creative process. This is what composers use. So this is paper and pencil, very low tech. It allows custom syntax. You see these uh, numbers uh, labeled around here. So you can deviate from the formal definition of the language. Uh, you can do cor corrections very easily. You can even kind of have this versioning system where you just scribble over the top, uh, and your old version is still there to be seen. Uh, you can have this kind of uh, two levels of kind of uh, an informal approach, a provisional approach, where you've got pencil, and then a kind of set in stone approach where you ink it in. And it's just quite easy to, to write in notes. So in this example, you've actually you've got this much less neat version here, where it's very easily been added to the, the, the score, the piece. And you've got, again, deviating from the formal notation. So what is it about this that supports creativity, that actually allows people to further their creative process? Well, before talking about that, let's uh, talk about programming and what aspects of the two types of notation we've seen already. So programming, obviously, is necessarily very formal. It has to be interpreted by a computer. But there's also ways we can define the language ourselves. So we can actually create custom syntax through class objects or abstractions and things like that. You can also make informal notation. So in comments, a very, very powerful tool to just jot notes around the side of the piece 
So you can actually, you can comment out a formal piece of syntax and keep it there. Okay, just like you could on the, on the page. And we call that secondary notation. And that's actually one of the dimensions of the cognitive dimensions of notation that we'll talk about in a second. So necessarily it does support creativity because you're building something. But it also supports flow in this immersive experience. I mean, hackers in the room will, uh, and live coders in the room will know that. Lemon, the Mon Mark Lemon talks about this as um, about notation as an, a barrier, effectively, to, to live interactive, uh, what he calls direct involvement. Uh, this abstraction layer prevents you from getting into the music. But he also <coughs> talks about the importance of a feedback cycle. Okay? Uh, and when notation gets in there, the feedback cycle gets uh, slower, effectively, and that's what breaks uh, the kind of direct involvement, the embodied interaction. So what happens is that you tend to get this way of interacting with computers. Okay, this is how you use a sequencer. You don't. Okay, this is also quite uh, the model that you see a lot, uh, and a performance is that you. You get someone on the computer and then other people who are not attached to the computer driving the music in a, in a live performance. So my recent work is focused on trackers, uh, which Thor mentioned, uh, which is a notation. Okay, you can quite clearly see that it's got pitches, volumes, uh, and this last column is things like crescendos. It's very similar to score notation. But this does support direct involvement and live, high level of liveness. I'm here to demonstrate. I want you to watch this and just see, not listen to the music necessarily, but just um, appreciate the user experience and how live it feels. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So he's trying to explain what's going on. Now I'm just going to experiment a bit. He's giving a tutorial, but he loses the plot and he gets involved in his interaction. And also notice the feedback cycle. Just uh, a few notes. And a few no dogs. That way, no notes won't be too long. Keep the dynamic. <laughs> so it's not real time. It's not live in the sense that a, uh, an instrument is live. Um, you don't hit a note and hear a note necessarily. There's this kind of stop, start, edit, audition cycle. Okay, but because. And to, ours, to our ears, it sounds very fragmentary and it's a bit of a cacophony. But he's not aware of that. Okay? And he's so immersed in the interaction that he doesn't realize how terrible he's sounding, even though he's recording a webcast. <laughs> so um, let's talk about uh, levels of liveness. And this is a concept, and this is not to be confused with Auslender's uh, ideas of liveness in a, a live music capacity. This is from programming. And this is, you have a notation, and you've got the thing the notation describes. And how easy is it to get from one to the other? Okay? Uh, level one liveness, it's, it's uh, so unlive, shall we say, that the specification doesn't even lead to an executable object. It just vaguely describes it in some way. Okay? It's very difficult to work with that and get an idea of how the system will actually be, except on a very abstract level. Then you've got the executable idea, which is, this idea that you've got source code, maybe, and a compiler. You write the source code for half an hour, and then you hit compile, and then you run. Okay? We're talking about a very, very slow feedback cycle. Okay? Doesn't support liveness. Okay? Or only a very small part of it. Um, next level up, this is the idea that you can run it, make a change, and it will update automatically. So anything you do will automatically be compiled in the background. We start to get into the area of kind of interpreted languages, uh, just-in-time uh, debugging and compiling and things like that. In this final uh, column here, I've actually put some of the examples uh, from music, and here you've got examples from uh, programming. Um, so edit, edit and continue for Visual Studio users. Then we move up to the final level, liveness level four, which is what we're familiar with in terms of music, which is you hit a key, you hear a key, a hearing note. 
Okay? This is instantly, as you make an interaction, the, the notation changes and the domain changes. Um, in programming, you can kind of think of that as a macro recording, say in Office or something like that. So what happens is that the concreteness uh, increases, you get lower level editing, but you lose a lot of the extractive power that you need uh, and you want in music. So you've got kind of programming languages and live coding is quite good at the top. You can define processes, but it's easier to get to the notes at the bottom. Right, I'm going to uh, spin through this quite quickly. Uh, basically, I've just modelled the user experience of music systems as a set of feedback loops. Um, I suggest uh, either that, uh, I'll make the slides available afterwards, that reference or uh, this reference for a, a crash course in the system. Um, and then what you do is you look at each feedback loop and you give it a level of liveness based on Tanamoto. So that's sequences effectively is that you play the instrument, it gets transcribed very quickly, but to actually interact with the notation is a lot less live. So that's what sequences and performance-driven systems are like. And trackers, which are based on auditions and then editing the notation, is a slight reversal of that. But how do we no analyze the notation? Okay. So the cognitive dimensions was developed for programming languages, and the idea is that it has uh, any number of um, kind of subjective experiential uh, qualities that you rate, okay? So uh, visibility, how visible is the data? Uh, how well does the notation uh, show uh, dependencies, hidden dependencies? So uh, a visual programming language is quite good at showing the dependencies uh, and therefore you kind of, the idea between each of these dimensions is that it's linear that is, it's got good or bad end, less or more. There is also this idea that each of the dimensions are orthogonal, so uh, they don't intersect, or they're not parallel. However, there are trade-offs between the dimensions. So if you make things more visible, um, then you uh, improve the display of uh, hidden dependencies, for example. If you make it easier to edit something, reduce the viscosity, uh, then you reduce the premature commitment, which is the idea that you don't want to think of ideas in advance, you want to play around with them, explore. So if it's easier to change the notation, the viscosity is quite good. Okay, so what I did is I converted this framework into a, a, a survey where people rate each of the, uh, the dimensions, basically on a five point uh, scale, and then plot it for different things. You can actually compare the um, music experience of different notations here. Uh, so this is sequences versus trackers, the one you saw. And if we look at some of the differences, it's, it's a lot easier to change the data, interact with the notation in the, in the tracker. Uh, it's just keyboard typing. You can almost touch type it. Harder to do that in a sequencer where it's mouse clicking and, and GUIs and things like that. Therefore, the provisionality, you know, you're not committed to an idea, that's much better. Uh, prevent progressive evaluation, that's the f audio feedback. Okay? That's the key aspect of making this live, is that you can make a change and audition that change. Um, and I did the same thing for the nine uh, components of flow, which I won't talk about, but what we can do is once you have quantitative data for this, you can do uh, a correlation between flow and the aspects of notation. Uh, so you can find out which dimensions of the notation actually enable uh, embodied interaction, direct involvement with the system. And this is still through notation. So this is the kind of, how do we get closer to the experience of performance, but mediated through notation? And you can see the ones that come out on top are, uh, it's got to be visually very fast feedback. You've got to have audio fast feedback. <coughs> Uh, and it's got to be easy to change uh, the notation. So a <coughs> mixture of the scores, the way we use them, but also that idea of the sketch and paper. And there's a, a linear regression which just confirms what the most important dimensions are. So, how are we doing for time? 15, is that including or excluding questions? Yes, including. Including questions. Well, I was going to get you to 
do max for cognitive dimensions, but maybe if you'd like to do that, we can do that in the questions later. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you.